Also in the news this week, in a cascade of headlines that all fit together just too well to not comment on, in the same week as the Bezos, the world's, well, I, oh, he was the world's richest man. I think he's like the second richest man now. Well, the he first, had the world's most expensive affair, and now he's not the world's richest man. Anymore. That's also true. That's also true. And uh, he went to outer space this week, which is also true. Um, getting me one step closer to my dream of seeing a billionaire die in space. Um, I'm, <laughs> I, yeah, you know, they talk often about those seven minutes of hell, uh, in, entering into Mars. And I do hope that I live long enough to see Elon Musk get incinerated, uh, in a fiery blaze as he tries to enter into Mars unsuccessfully. Uh, that, but that we got one step awesome. closer this week. Yeah. Uh, look, um. It's hard to look at that headline and not look at some of the weather and climate news coming out this week and sort of see a connection of like, well, let's talk about the climate news first. The Russian permafrost has started to thaw to the point where it is releasing lots of carbon into the atmosphere and they're uncovering mammoth bones. And what has alarmed me the most about the mammoth boats and all of these things that have been frozen for tens of thousands of years um, has been that the media's reaction to this has largely been, oh, isn't that cool? Isn't that neat? Isn't it a, a kind of a nifty thing that we're finding all these artifacts and that sort of thing? And the answer is, of course, no. And there are also going to be diseases and viral strains in the Arctic permafrost that uh, hung around in prehistoric times, uh, you know, not prehistoric, like Jurassic times, but like, you know, old times when it was cold and they've been there for tens of thousands of years, but they also were created in a time when the human population was one biologically hardier, um, as in like we were stronger, we could handle the, the human body could withstand more diseases and that sort of thing. They've done studies on that. Our bodies have gotten weaker as time has gone on and we've gotten better at using technology. Um, we were of stronger stock and there are fewer of us. So when these diseases would spread around the planet, they would eventually kind of corner themselves, get into a pocket with the human population. And if they were really good at what they did, they just killed themselves off. Um, that's no longer a situation in a planet that has 8 billion people on it. Um, yeah, look it, at this chunk of woolly mammoth that was chewed on by something. Let me hold it up to my face and take a picture of it. Uh, it and all the ice. Yeah, right. And, and we're going to go and set a team in to go and check out this thing. And, oh, of course, we're going to get medically screened for all the diseases we know about when we're coming back. All the ones that we have on record. Um, but we don't have records of all these diseases <laughs> hanging out in the ice. Yeah, this guy's skin fell off on the plane. We don't know why. Like, uh, and so you have that happening. You have obviously the story coming out of Brazil and uh, the rainforest, the Amazon, where the eastern rainforest is now uh, producing more carbon than it is stopping. I am, of course, old enough to remember when I was sitting in school as a little boop, little boop, Novembrino getting taught. All right, little Chris, remember. The Amazon is the Earth's lungs, and it breathes in all the carbon dioxide, and it emits oxygen. And, like, I'm reading this headline this week, and it's like the Amazon's gotten emphysema from smoking, and one of the lungs has collapsed. Um, and another sign that our planet is dying. Um, it is wounded. And that Final Fantasy VII was, in fact, a documentary shot in the future. And uh, n not, not not like this hyperbole that I thought growing up of like, all right, all right, Barrett, chill out. We got to save the planet. They're going to destroy the... No, nah, maybe, maybe Barrett's right. Maybe I should be doing that more often. Yeah, I was I was right when I was 19 and wanted to... Was was real into, like, Ludditism. <laughs> I, I mean, so... And, and then we have this other story about wild hogs that i saw which I, I think okay kind of also gets us back into the vaccine discussion and how to like okay how do we better interact with conservatives i i mean they clearly guys like michael brennan daughtery want us to you know really introspect and think about this and to, on today's episode we're doing a little bit of that um but like we have this story about feral hogs where there are over 7 million feral hogs in the United States and they're responsible for the carbon emissions that are the equivalent of 1 million cars. 
Um, they are, of course, extremely disruptive to populations. Um, and, and we have a similar issue with deer as well in many places where apex predators have been driven out. Um, at one level, you read all the time about the extinction of species. And of course, that's going to continue to be a problem. Here's the weird thing that's going to be happening concurrently. And that is kind of hard to get the brain around or requires the ability to hold like two ideas that seem to be slightly in tension with each other at the same time. There are species like, let's say, the shoebill stork that are endangered um, because there are decreasing wetlands in Africa. I know, like, where did I pull that one from? It's just, uh, that was the first one that popped in my head. Um, but meanwhile, you got warthogs or uh, wild boars, feral hogs and stuff and deer and stuff that are wildly overpopulating areas um, and can lead to population spikes and collapses and stuff in ways that can be really dangerous for the humans and the entirety of the animal and the environment around there. These, these, are, these aren't wild these aren't wild hogs or wild boar. They're, they're escaped domestic pigs that have, that have gone feral. Um, I mean, they're, they're, they're just, they're not like, there are places with natural boar populations. Uh, these are, these are intro, like reintroduced escaped invasive, like wild animals that are out competing the stuff that is that like the natural uh, predators that were there. They're much like they're, They'll outforage all of the small rodents that would support like mid-sized predators, and those mid-sized predators can't take down something that's that that's that big and aggressive. So, like, unless you have like a native mountain lion population, like that's the only thing that's picking off a boar. Like, even, <laughs> even like a bobcat can't like take down that shit. Like, they the the boar has a lot of weight on a bobcat and a lot of like, and they're smart. They're smart. Yeah. No, they're really, really smart. So, I mean, think about it like this, guys. For about 75 years or so, uh, really, maybe more like 50, but like, really, I mean, how many generations of hogs at this point? Um, for generations, we pumped their genetics full of like super stuff for growing and that sort of thing. They're well, not getting that very- stuff. Very specifically, we reduced the amount of fat that they, we made them jacked. We put them on steroids. Essentially, we increased the 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 fat to protein ratio. So they are just like yoked pigs. I uh, so <laughs> the very it, healthy hearts. <laughs> they're yoked, big, smart. I I mean, so like I, this sounds far fetched in a weird way, but like. The idea, I w- I'll stop calling them wild boar. I'll, it just, it's like, uh, you just, wild, you have the phrase. Wild pig. Wild pig. Wild wild pig. pig. That's exactly how I was like. We, new rule. Feral pig. Well, yeah, feral pig. Wild pig. I, I, I gotta go wild. I, I just, wild, wild is more fun than feral. Um, Like, like, like that, cause they're not, and then a feral implies that they're supposed to be tame. I, I don't know that they're supposed to be tame. They're just wild now. Uh, I, I think, I've thought for years that we should take these populations that need to be re- reduced and give out hunting tags in supplement to food stamps in rural areas. That that's actually uh, well. In in I grew up in New Jersey where we had a, a terrible terrible uh, deer overpopulation problem. Like the interface between there's so many like corn and soybean fields and the the population density, like not like one hard winter should have stabilized this equilibrium. I mean, it would be horrific. There would have been a lot of starvation of that population of that deer population, but we have so much agriculture that they're able to forage, uh, forage all winter long. The winters aren't as bad as they used to be. There's it's like every 25 minutes, uh, in New Jersey, there's a, a deer related car accident. Um, and so they, the, um, there are programs where hunters after they've, uh, after they've, um, harvested for the amount that, uh, is appropriate for their tag, like the tag that they got, you're able to, uh, get tags from a soup kitchen, go out and harvest a deer and bring, bring it, like essentially supply these soup kitchens with, uh, with meat. Um, and it was a, it was a fairly, fairly successful program yeah no I'm, I'm glad you brought that up robert because like this kind of gets into the second second topic that i think is important um we recently had like another mass gun tragedy i i suspect it won't be too long until we have another um and and i suspect uh because of that because of the society that we live in that you know again democrats are going to be talking about gun control and that sort of thing and and i want 
us to kind of be thinking about gun control policy in a more nuanced way where like on one hand we talk about restrictions on getting guns while introducing maybe in the same package a program that encourages the hunting of populations like these wild pigs because like now we've talked about these wild pigs and what it what a disruptive force they are let's talk about what the actual diagnosis is for the wild pig problem um by professionals um is that it is going to be necessary to call about 60 percent to 80 percent of these wild pig and in order to do that in america we're going to need the aid of skilled recreational hunters and we're going to need to encourage them to do this and them doing so is going to be good for the environment it's also going to provide meat in a time when meat is getting more scarce look it's not an accident that uh, you're hearing more about chicken sandwiches and it's not just because ricky's nashville hot is the hottest in dallas baby um it's because meat is getting more scarce the price of meat is going up um over the next 25 30 years red meat that sort of meat is going to be going up venison and this wild pig is going to be a very good source of meat um and we've already created this situation for ourselves so we might as well one do something that's good for the environment two um assuage people who think that we're trying to quote unquote take away their way of life that we're actually doing the opposite that we want to encourage and foster and support give a carrot to their way of life get, and say hey we don't just we don't just not want to get rid of your way of life we think your way of life has a place in our way of life and we want you to use your way of life in harmony with our way of life this whole working together thing that we're always talking about we want to work with you um i, I mean i think that something like this can be a win on climate can also be a win on gun control and can be a win quote unquote for conservatives that they know that we're not like trying to take away their right to hunt that we want them to hunt it's the conservation part of the conservative uh program like it uh it's that, and that, let that long last guys we get that our city lives and our country <laughs> lives are different from one another too we we want to lean into that yeah well yeah and you know if you want to deal with the problem of gun violence instead of just creating wedge issue voters then you would have to do things like talking about you know disqualifying people with a domestic violence conviction from gun ownership and full disclosure i am a gun owner you know i'm so far left you get your guns back and listening to this, you know, culture war crap that's not, you're not going to pass gun control. You're not going to go take people's guns away. That's never going to happen in America. Like, it's absurd on its face. But boy, does it get the base to show up and vote. Uh, and, and it's a strong message that I think becomes very hard to message against. Because, like, look, we always talk about how good the Republicans are at messaging. They're not invincible. Like, look, like, like we've watched them struggle on this COVID-19 thing. Like, uh, the first segment of the show that we, we taped here. I mean, we were talking about how Mitch McConnell and the congressional Republicans are actually laboring to find a way to message to their people to go and get this vaccine. Like, they're not, they're good. They're better at it than the Democrats, but they're not juggernauts at this either. And it, like if they're, they're less terrible at it than we are. Right. So if you have a position that says, no, actually, we have this whole hunting program package in the bill. And it's like a big it's like there are three parts of the bill and, and right in the middle, the glue that actually holds the whole thing together is this big win for conservatives where like we're going to set up like wild pig hunting ranges and we are going to help identify and maybe even help get people out to um places where there are deer overpopulations to help get these deer numbers back down we want to tag and document what these populations are we want a better understanding of what they are we want to be liberally giving out permits and even training on how to use a hunting rifle um like it's all in the bill here people um so when you yeah. say we're trying to destroy your way of life have you read page 637 through like 852 because that entire 200 page click is all about the hunting bill what? Yeah, I deer mean, overpopulation in Oregon is creating a real danger on the highways because people keep plowing into these deer all the time. It's it's a real problem. It's real. It's real. No, um, I, I that, mean, oh, go ahead, Dan. To, to a ahead. degree, I mean, ironically enough, that is that is largely the case here in California. Uh, we have 
uh, here in wine country, the the boars create a or th- now now you got me going, Chris. The wild pigs create a uh, um, create a real problem with the grapes. They they will go in in late late July, late August before before these very very fancy uh, wineries can pick their grapes, and they will just graze themselves full. And you would not believe how good a wild pig tastes when it is ja- like when it is completely full of grapes. It's delicious. It is it is a sought after <laughs> commodity. Like they're they're like uh, it's it's better. It's definitely better than grain finishing your your. Uh, your so your, uh, so nice of you to stuff yourself, little piggy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but th- we ha- we do have we do have populate like uh, populations in especially in uh, after like wildfires come through, as uh, as new growth is coming up, the pigs can be really disruptive because they just go and they they'll graze everything off before it even gets a chance to recover, um, and so in those wildfire areas, they're like they've opened it up like anybody who wants a permit, you pay you pay your forty five bucks for your permit and you like you're you're good to go. But it's, I mean, on top of all of your other licenses and uh, everything else, but it's it's already, I mean, it's it's already part of the program here in California, Stan. Like, yeah, yeah, and, and, and I, I basically like, so like California's got its like fees or whatever. I would want a Fed program. It's like, hey, guess what? We'll even comp your fees if you're just gonna go and do the work. Like, like there's literally gonna be no barrier whatsoever. We'll cover permitting. We'll cover training. Um, if you want to go out and do it. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get you set up with a hunting rifle, a hunting rifle, um, to go and hunt. Um, and, and then the other part of this too, um, like we were just focusing on the hunting part of this. The other part of this too, is I think this could be great for some of these communities for barbecues, community events, um, you know, big, big kind of cook-offs and stuff. It can be part of like the local heritage festival every year after the big wild pig hunt. Uh, what do you do with a wild pig? I don't know, but pulled pork sounds delicious all of a sudden, especially if they're stuffed with some of those grapes. Uh, like, <laughs> uh, I mean, I think that could, that, I think it, it could be a big win-win, and it can show that, like, look, I, I, one of the challenges with policy in this country, America, is always going to be that you have blue cities. Um, on the coast of this country, and it's always going to be that way. There's going to be a few blue cities through the middle here, um, and then through the big interior of this is going to be big, wide open spaces. Montana, your entire life is going to be big and wide open. Ditto with Wyoming and Idaho and Kansas and Nebraska. You name these places. If anything, they'll get more sparse as time goes on, even as the population increases, which will make the blue cities even denser. There's always going to be this like two track America thing. And good policy in America needs to reflect that we actually understand the real two-track nature of this and that we're trying to do things that are wins for both tracks of America. There is, there is a way to interface those tracks where it's synergistic instead of a, uh, a, a conflict point. Like, there, there, is, there is merit to, to both to both lifestyles there is there's advantages to to both of those things and then there's also very distinct disadvantages and the more that we can work to to maximize the advantage first i mean this is it's fairly banal but it's like no, no, it's, 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 it's <laughs> no it's missing from our policy right like, like, no like so much of policy and stuff that I mean, because it all comes out of blue cities, whether we're talking about like thinky tanks in DC or talking about Brooklyn, like sort of like leftist stuff, it's all coming out of a city. And very often it, it really doesn't get that. Like they're the rest of the country, like I, I, for as much progress as we progressives want to bring, like at the end of the day, Kansas is still mostly going to look like Kansas. Like, like, you know, Wichita, Topeka might be more bitching of cities, maybe slightly. Um, but like, you know, you know what I mean? Like, like, like the, the uh, it, it, it's possible to overstate. Like, I'm not trying to magically transform Missouri into something else. I'm, you know, trying to find a, we need to have a policy that can make things better in the cities that we all live in um, and not be stopped by these weird fears from people in these, you know, distant places that like we're coming to take their tractor from them for some reason. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, and the first step to getting there is for everybody to start wanting to talk, one, talk to each other, and two, hold their politicians accountable instead of cheering for their team doing terrible things. That's also true. Uh, I mean, and, th- and that gets into, uh, like, uh, well, okay, real quickly here. Um, we have Trump surfacing again at yet another event this weekend, and this one was notable um, on an upcoming episode of Shake Them Ropes, my, my wrestling show. It's like an Ask Me Anything show. So if you ever wanted to check that out and wanted to hear something that was like the least wrestling as possible, that's probably the episode that'll be out next week. I get asked, does Trump use kayfabe? Um, and if you want to hear like the long form answer of that, I you, you'll hear me go into that. Um, to give something fresh for people, um, after we taped that, he did this event here on Friday night or Saturday. Um, and he very clearly said, uh, in no unclear terms, that he won the election in 2020 and that there is actually still legitimately a chance that, you know, they will certify the vote or look at the routers. Uh, Trump the routers, knows, folks. The, the routers. routers, the routers. Love, you, it's unbelievable what's on the routers. We won, even in spite, even without the routers. We, we very clearly won, but the routers, the routers, folks. God, I have to give it to Sonny Bunch. Sonny Bunch put it best. Like, I want nothing more now than to hear Donald Trump explain how to set up, like, wi-fi in your house just just like basic wi-fi in your house all right first you need to contact your isp but yeah uh i he doesn't have any idea what that like like it's it's funny because then a new talking point that he's very fond of now is he like literally explains what disinformation does like it's it's actually very devious because it's like literally like it's like he says, I am lying to you, essentially. And then like people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that I said I am lying to you, let me remind you once again that I won the election in 2020. Uh, and they say, yeah. And they say, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then and, he says, donate here. Yeah. And he says, donate here. And he's taken in $75 million to his pack. Um, he has not used any of it for recounting. Uh, but... He now has a $75 million war chest for when he runs for president, which, um, which look, with uh, his spending habits will last about two weeks. Yes. But the other flip of this here, man, is that a uh, $75 million head start basically makes it impossible for all but like two or three Republicans to have any prayer of seizing the nomination from him. Um, I, I mean, $75 million is so much money. It requires you to go to the donors and say, like, Ron DeSantis has to go like, hey, trust me, I, I know how to beat Donald Trump. I, I, I know sometimes I'm still a little scared of him, but if you just give me the $100 million, I've got him beat. Uh, like, no, because they they need to give yeah. him $75 million to get him started. So then he actually needs to be going, I, I actually just need, I, I said $100 million, I need $150 million. Uh, like, it's not, I mean, it's a tough sell. Um, yeah. Would they be better off? They they know Trump. It was bad to them. It was bad, but they survived. Um, which is, you know, I mean, this, look, look, that's how they talk about COVID. At this point in positioning for 2022 and 2024, it would be really, really awesome if someone, anyone on the left, learned from the Lincoln Project and, and how to go knives out. Uh, on who, though? Uh, I, 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 how do you knife out Trump at this point? I, I mean, I think he's damn near untouchable. It's it's a well, he's untouchable question. with his base, but there's a lot of people who, after January sixth, especially, like they they don't want to be part of that. And like, if you can't look through all of the media and everything that's come out and find a good attack ad that will swing a general election, you're not trying really hard. Okay, so I, I mean, look, I still think. Trump winning the nomination, which I think is fairly likely, is not me saying Trump wins the election if he runs against Joe Biden again. No, I, no. I, no I, I actually think he's a he's sort of a, a fail, uh, like sort of a guarantee. Like, like I think it's really hard for him to beat Joe Biden. Honestly, he had, uh, he, had know, the string of, he stopped winning for one second, and once you stop the once you stop the winning, it's real hard to get that like get that juice going again. Incumbency is also a really powerful advantage in our country. I, I mean, it just is. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I mean, that's the no, other thing. No, I don't think it's possible to stop him from winning a Republican primary if he runs. So I think that trying to do that is a waste of time. I think gearing up for a general is the strategy. Oh, ju- just start attacking him now. You know, actually, to that point, there, there probably is no real harm in attacking him now, because if he loses, he's not going to stop attacking the Republicans for betraying him. 
Right? Um, yeah. Disloyalty yeah, to Trump I, won't be tolerated. I actually, I, I think the, the, I'd per, I, I don't know. I'm, I am a little bit torn. Would you, would you want a, uh, is Trump easier to beat or is, uh, is a DeSantis without 